Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for extending the invitation to for, for myself to be here this morning. Uh, it's, I'm very excited to be here. I've never been here before in a morning service, and as, as mentioned, I've got my lovely wife down the back with my almost four-month-old son, so if he's a bit noisy in the service, please, uh, we do apologise in advance. Um, but as I said, I'm really excited to be here and um, really excited to get into the Word of God uh, this morning and see what he has to say to us from the letter to the church of the Smyrnans. But before we do, how about uh, I just pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to open your Word this morning. Father, we just ask that you may uh, speak to each one of us this morning. May you have a message that would uh, just speak to us for where we are at in our life today. Lord, may you just uh, speak through me this morning and uh, may your word just come to life for each one of us, that you may encourage us or teach us or rebuke us wherever we may need it, Father. We do pray for this and we pray it in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So before I read out our passage this morning, which is found in Revelation, I'd like for us to turn to Revelation chapter 1. So I know last week uh, I did listen to Richard's message online. Um, he spoke from Revelation chapter 1, uh, gave a bit of a description of what Jesus Christ says of himself, but there was three verses that he missed, and actually it worked out really well because I was going to touch on these three verses this week, and that was verses 1, 2, and 3 in chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles out, open them up to there. And it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I just want to stop there. Remember, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we go through, as you guys go through the seven letters, as you read Revelation in your own personal reading time, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember that. Keep that in the back of your mind. Which God gave him to show his servants things must things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. I just need to make mention, I am reading from the New King James Version this morning, if your versions aren't adding up, so I am from the New King James. But we see that the revelation of Jesus Christ, God gave it to him to show his servants, and he gave it to, then he signified it by his angel who gave it to John, who then wrote it down in, this, in, 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 in word so that we can have it today. So very interesting how we've got revelation in its entirety today but verse 3 it says this blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near blessed is he who reads it's the only book in the bible that actually says you are blessed if you read not only if that if you hear the words and keep those things which are written in it so i just pray this morning that as we go through this uh, church of smyrna that we would hear the words that we'd keep these things for the time is near. So if you flip over, I'm guessing you probably can flip over quite easily to Revelation chapter 2, and we are reading from verses 8 to 11 this morning. And it says this, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, last week you would have heard um, about the church in Ephesus, uh, which in my Bible actually has the loveless church. Um, and I do hope that in the last week, after the message from Richard last week, that you're able to uh, go deeper or return to your first love, the Lord Jesus Christ, in this last week. But this week we're looking, as our text has already said, at the church in Smyrna. Or as your Bible might have it as a title, the persecuted church. So as you were just looking up there before about Ukraine, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, we'll actually touch on persecution. Well, it's very much the focus of this morning's message. Just by way of reminder, and I, I think it's probably prudent to do it, it's, just, it's obviously the second church you guys are studying at the moment. And when we look in the book of, the, book of Revelation, the seven churches, there are lots of facets to these letters. 
And we find in these seven letters that you can view them from a fourfold approach. The first is that these were actual letters sent to the actual church, in our case this morning, to the church in Smyrna. The second is that these letters have been bound up in the word to be applied to all churches throughout all time. So therefore, it has meaning for us as a church this morning. Thirdly, and I know some may differ on this point, and that's okay, but I believe it to be true that each letter is prophetic in a sense that it aligns with a certain time within church history. And it's for this reason that you may hear uh, some people saying that, we live in, that we're living in the Laodicean age, which I must say is actually not something to be proud of. And lastly, each of these letters ends with the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, as I look around this morning, I see everyone has two ears, and I think maybe some people have some assistance with hearing, but either way, there is a message in here for each one of us this morning. And one more aspect that these letters are just so uh, brilliantly weaved together is that within each of the letters, there's the same sort of format, which Richard touched on last week. Each letter begins with Christ identifying himself in a different manner. And today we'll have a look at what Christ means when he says he's the first and the last who was dead and who came back to life and why he used this when talking to the church in Smyrna. Each letter mentions the good things that Christ says about the church. But then he also mentions the negative things that he has against the church. But you may have noticed in our reading that today Christ has nothing bad to say to the church in Smyrna. And we'll have a look at why. And lastly, as you'll see in all these letters, there's a reward or something special for those who overcome. And as we'll look at today's, we'll see that today's reward is extra special but very costly. So let's get stuck in and have a look at verse 8. And verse 8 says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. So Smyrna, where is Smyrna? Oh, good, it's working. Smyrna is located in modern-day Turkey, located between Ephesus and Pergamon. And you'll cover the Pergamon church next week, I believe. Interestingly, it is still there today, but it is known by the name of Izmir. It was a wealthy and very beautiful port city, and it was a very important city in its time. History suggests there was about 100,000 residents, and during the Roman period, it was a city of great beauty. And I actually had a look online at some of these pictures. It looked like a really great place to visit, crystal clear water and everything. So, very beautiful place. There were a number of temples, though, built um, to the Roman gods, and for those who are interested in know history probably better than I do, that there was a temple to Homer built in Smyrna. There was a strong emperor worship uh, in Smyrna to the point where it was required, and if it was not carried out, it would be punishable by death. For the early Christians living in Smyrna, not only, not only did they face persecution from the pagans, but there was a very large and actively hostile Jewish population that made it extremely difficult to live there as Christians. And we see these hostile Jews poured out in our text today. Now, the name Smyrna, there's a few different things where it could be derived from, but one that I thought was very interesting is that it can be derived from the name myrrh. And as you'd be familiar, myrrh um, is used to prepare the dead, and it was actually supposedly traded a lot through Smyrna, but it's very fitting for a place with the name of Smyrna because this is where Christians would face persecution unto death in many cases. So Smyrna was a very worldly, godless city and I'm sure you're already, well I made comparisons to possibly our city that we live in today. But in verse 8 we find Christ identifying himself as the first and the last who was dead and came back to life. Now, if you're sitting there going, why would Christ use this title when addressing the church? What's the significance with using this title? The first and the last who came back to life. Why? By using the phrase first and the last, it encapsulates the whole of anything. So 
I thought of uh, running, the ra- running a race. So if, I like cross country as a child. So if you came first, if John came first and Jerry came last, everybody else had to come somewhere within there. It encapsulates everything by, naming, going by, by saying, I am the first and the last. In our instance of the Saviour, he's not only the first and the last, he's the beginning and the end, and he's the Alpha and the Omega, and we read that in Revelation 22, verse 13. Christ stands above any worldly authority. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn over to John chapter 1, verse 3, we're going to have a look at uh, how Jesus uh, encapsulates everything from the beginning to the end, because it's very important that we uh, work out and understand why he's done this to this church, because it's a very comforting fact um, when we work it out. So in John chapter 1, you'll probably be very familiar with this passage as it uh, talks about in the beginning was the word, and we're talking about Jesus here. But in verse 3 it says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing, nothing was made that was made. So Christ was before everything. All things have been made through him. Uh, he, was, he is the first. He is the beginning. And if we flip over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3, it's a bit harder to find. 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 10, we read what we read there. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Christ is the end of all things. When he comes, he is going to wrap up this world at the end of the millennium, then we're going to live in eternity. He's going to come before him, but he is the end of everything. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the God from eternity past to eternity future, if you can wrap your mind around that. An easier way is he's the everlasting God. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go, only Christ's reign is eternal. Think about that for a moment from the perspective of our salvation. Christ died on a cross, was buried for three days, and came to life again. He is the God who sees his children's suffering and understands it from his own experiences. He has the power to lay down his life and take it up again. We read in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, it says, He is the author, or some versions have the originator, He's the beginning of our faith. And he's the finisher or the perfecter of our faith. He begins it and he carries it through to completion. If we were just even to think about that for a moment, how praiseworthy that is. So if you're about to face intense persecution, like this church in Smyrna, isn't it of great comfort to know that you would worship a God who loves you very much, who has been through the trials, including death, who is the author and the finisher of your salvation. It's the most comforting way that he could address himself to a church that was about to go through a severe time of testing. It reminds me of Psalm 23, actually, and I I was going to put it up, but then I thought, no, it'd actually be really good if everyone could turn to Psalm 23, or a lot of you may even remember it from the days when you are in Uh, Sunday school and and you'd probably have to learn Psalm 23 but Psalm 23 displays God's care for us that he is our shepherd and I'll touch on it shortly around persecution but I think this is of great comfort when we read Psalm 23. It says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, though I may go through such intense ordeals here on earth, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is our shepherd. A shepherd leads their flock. He looks after them. He cares for them. He protects them. Our great high shepherd is Christ. He goes before us. He goes behind us. He protects us. And then his word even says, I will never leave you 
nor forsake you. And what a promise we have. What a promise we can hold on to this morning that he is the first and the last, the one who is dead and who has come back to life. In verse 9, back to Revelation, sorry, sorry, you've got to flip around a little bit this morning. Back to verse 9 in Revelation, uh, Christ mentions those good characteristics he had for the church in Smyrna. He knew their tribulation or afflictions or suffering, as some versions might have it, and he knew of their poverty. And yet he says they are rich. The church in Smyrna, when I read this, was an example of what Christ said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You may have actually read in the latest, uh, I get the Barnabas magazine uh, subscription, you may have read, read in the latest edition of the Barnabas magazine the story that was recounted in the editorial. A, cr a committed Christian remarked that she did not want to die until she had experienced life on earth to the full and enjoyed, it all, and enjoyed all it could offer. For her, heaven seemed to have little attraction and was relegated to as far in the future as possible. How sad is that? I do hope this morning our heart's desire is for the Lord and his things. Let the church of Smyrna be a reminder to us that we are only passing through in this world and that the things that are done for Christ are the only things that count. As, as C.T. Studd put it so brilliantly, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Now we see this odd phrase in verse 9, the synagogue of Satan, used by Christ here. We won't spend too much time on it, as I do want to keep things moving, but other to say that these were Jews, these were people opposed to the mission and the message of the church. Some might say they had essentially allowed Satan to use them as a vessel in persecuting the Christians. And remember what Christ said back in John chapter 8 verse 44 to the Jews at the time he said this he said you are the father you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it these Jews embodied all of what Christ had said in John they were full of evil, full of, had full of intent of destruction. And it's actually been said that the Jews were the biggest persecutors of the church in the first century. And verse 10 in, in Revelation chapter 2 actually tells us that's exactly what they did to the believers in Smyrna. They persecuted them. Now remembering for a moment that these letters have application for us in our time as well. And so I say to you this morning that persecution is coming and is in actual fact already here. I only just heard this week while doing some reading for this morning that Christians are the most persecuted people on the earth. That's something you'll never hear a government tell, say. Persecu Christians are the most persecuted people on the earth. Our utopian view of Christianity is coming to an end. We live in a country right now, whether you realise it or not, where my rights take precedence over your moral code. That's what's being championed. It's been heading this way for... We're now heading the way that it has been for many centuries beforehand, where being a Christian was hard. It seems, though, at the moment that, unlike North Korea or those other places, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, that the cost is still far lower in Australia... But I ask, for how much longer? I heard a speaker say the other day that 98% of the world is unconverted. This means we are a minority. Christians are a minority. And I'll tell you what the world will think of you. If we turn across to John chapter 15, this is 
This is what Jesus says that the world will say about you if you trust in him. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. The whole, this whole little passage talks about it, but I'm only going to touch on verses 18 and 19. It says, if the, Jesus is saying here, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I have, if you're a believer sitting here this morning, I have some news for you. The world hates you. Now maybe you're experiencing it right now. In your own situations in life, you're actually experiencing some persecution. Maybe you've felt the full force of persecution in another stage of life. Or maybe you've just never felt persecution for the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. Persecution can take on many faces. Some believers may endure social rejection because of their beliefs. And I probably think that maybe it's not as common in Australia as it should be. Others are denied promotions at work because of their stands as believers. And we've probably seen in the last two years, more than any so in the last decade, people being ridiculed for their faith at work. Still, others pay for their lives as martyrs in, Christ, in Jesus Christ, for, for faith in Jesus Christ. Hear what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The world hates you and you will suffer persecution as a believer. My question to you is, persecution is a sign of seeking to live a godly life. And it's a hard thing to think about or ponder as Am I experiencing persecution now? And I've been thinking a lot about this this last couple of weeks as I was preparing and examining my life and realising I shirk away so often or I fade away into the background when I should stand up and speak for Christ. For example, tomorrow when you go to work and the work colleagues ask, how was your weekend? What did you get up to? How often, I know I am, how often... I know many other Christians are afraid to even mention that we went to church. An older gentleman I know says that if someone asks that question, it's the greatest invitation to speak up about your Sunday and you'll never know where that conversation might go. I mean, the fact is that meeting with your brothers and sisters in Christ should far outweigh that shopping trip that you had yesterday or that party you went to last night. Being here this morning is such a privilege. And it should come across as that, not as an obligation to your work colleagues. Because if it does come across as an obligation, that's not a great reflection on your love for Jesus Christ. And I'm sure, well I hope, that you're not here this morning out of obligation. Or what about when you drive home after church this morning and you fill up with fuel on the way home and you walk into the cashier and he starts making small talk saying, how's your day been, what have you been up to? Will you tell them about your time here this morning? What are we scared of? I can't believe how often I have conveniently just skipped over this simple thing. How often I've frozen because of my fear of others and the possible consequences. And to think that God says in his word in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 14 that you are blessed when you're insulted for the name of Christ. Or in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, when Christ himself said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. He goes on in the next verse to say, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Is that not enough of a motivation to speak up for Christ? Or let alone out of the love that you have for our Saviour? Paul said in, uh, to Timothy in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 7, he said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
So are you prepared to stand up for Christ? Are you ready to give an answer, no matter the consequences this morning? Have you resolved now, and you need to resolve now, have you resolved now to honour Christ as Lord when the persecution comes? The persecution is going to come. Have you resolved now to honour him as Lord in your life? As you will have noticed in our passage, and as I mentioned at the beginning, Christ doesn't have any negative things to say about this church, the church in Smyrna. Now, I'm sure they didn't have it all together. I'm almost certain they didn't have it all together. But he knew that the thing that the church needed to hear the most was to hear encouragement and exaltation to be faithful. So let us remind ourselves of what he actually told the church in verse 10. So if you flip back across to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, what did he say? He said, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. We are told not to be fearful, but rather faithful. I struggled with this a little bit in my preparation, actually, because it's such an easy statement to say. Be faithful, not fearful. Be faithful, not fearful. Be faithful, not fearful. Real easy. It rolls off the tongue and it's scriptural. But how do I be faithful when fear, when I, and not to fear what comes? I actually was uh, doing some reading on it and uh, some of you might know that Dr. Jeremiah, he's a Bible teacher and he says this about fear. He says, fear is a natural human response, but we live supernatural lives through the power of Christ in us. End quote. We tend to fear because we're trying to avoid dying or some sort of hardship. We're trying to avoid a hardship of some type. And actually, when it comes to dying, my brother, I've got two brothers, but one of my brothers recently said that if you were to die of a, die of a car accident, a tree falling on you, COVID, or a heart attack, or for just for example, that you will not get to heaven and God say, whoa, hold on a minute, what are you doing here? You weren't meant to be here yet. I found that really encouraging because it reminded me that God holds my life in his hands and when my time is up, it will be because he says so. Not because of some freak accident, not because of some disease or even as a martyr. That may be the means but the thing will be, but the timing will be to the exact minute, the exact moment in accordance with God's plan. The exact moment. God knows our, has, he has our life in his hands. I mean, for example, we have, we find Rahab in the Bible. She having, I read this week, having to choose. Rahab, the Israelites were coming to Jericho and she had the choice. And she heard and she believed she could either tremble, she could have either trembled with fear or place her confidence in God. And we know that she did the latter. And you know, we are no different. We can choose to tremble in fear with what we, hate, what, with, with what we hear going on. You turn the news on, you will, you, will, uh, you will tremble in fear with what's going on around the world. We'll tremble in fear with the potential persecution that could be coming our way. Or we could choose to remind ourselves of what we know of our Creator. He sits on his throne, he rules over all things according to his perfect will and he's doing it right now. He is the Father and he loves us. So be faithful and not fearful. The way to lose fear is to replace it to gain faithfulness in him. Where fear used to live, Faith will move in and take over. Therefore, faithful be in, be, therefore, being faithful involves being true to Jesus Christ, following him and taking him at his word. We can overcome because of our faith in him. Faith replaces fear.
And if you'd like to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, well, I actually don't, I already have the screen, sorry. Uh, if you'd like, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, I will actually turn to it because I just cut out a little bit there to, to get the point across. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul says this, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. For the love of Christ compels us that those who live should no longer live for ourselves, that we should no longer live for, for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. Christ's sacrifice makes no, requ no, requ no request unreasonable. Christ's sacrifice makes no request unreasonable. His dying love and risen glory, it impelled the early church, the church's first generation, to evangelise the Roman world against severe, massive persecution and challenging circumstances. If we need encouragement to witness and step out and be faithful, we should consider the cross afresh and God's love displayed on it. And we will obviously do that later this morning, consider what he did on the cross for us. And when we look to our sovereign God, who can do and work through all things, we can be filled with hope. The hope of the world to come. Our hope found in the resurrection of Christ. Our hope in the glory of Christ. A very encouraging passage, so I would like, would like us to flip across this. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 20, uh, verse 20 through to chapter 4, verse 1. If I can find it. If this is an encouraging passage, I don't know what is. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he, Paul says this, For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. For our citizenship is in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven. So I encourage you this morning, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. What are we so afraid of? Our citizenship is in heaven. We're known and we're claimed by Christ. We're bound for a place where our bodies will be transformed and it'll be absolutely amazing. Yes, persecution in this life can be extreme, but it has no power in the next life. No power whatsoever. Romans 8 verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? Four verses down in Romans chapter 8 and verses 39, Paul goes on, he's persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Nothing, nothing, Paul lists about 16 things there, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. What a reassuring fact that is this morning. Nothing, Paul says, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are secure and safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. He is in control, my brothers and sisters, this morning. We have no reason to fear the things of this world. Rather, I would encourage us that as we see persecution on the horizon or if maybe we experience persecution today, not to run in fear, but rather be faithful 
to the one who has claimed us. Be faithful, not fearful, and take heart. Which is my last point for this morning. In verses 10 and 11, we, re- we see the re- reward for the overcomer, for those who persevere and overcome. So let's just read the last part of our passage this morning. From uh, the end of, end of verse 10. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What we miss out on when we forsake the feast above for the crumbs below by succumbing to the things of this world and joining in with them. Here Christ is telling the church that if they are faithful, they will receive the crown of life. There are actually five crowns um, that I had a bit of a study in the New Testament. Um, Now crowns were like a wreath, a prize, a ribbon that you get in school when you win a race. And we're no different, we're in the race of life. Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 3. I did a little bit, I... I, um, included the five crowns here and we're we're going to talk about the last one but just as a bit of uh, uh, visibility for everyone here that you get the imperishable crown that's found in 1 Corinthians for those who press on faithfully a crown of rejoicing a crown of righteousness for those who loved his appearing a crown of glory for those who feed his flock and today we read about the crown of life the crown of life for those who suffered for his sake And the crown is very relevant for the church in Smyrna. Sorry, some people taking a photo of that. I'll go back and have a bit of a look um, and have a bit of a study during your week. And if you find any more, please let me know because I somehow suspect there's probably seven crowns, but I could only find five. Um, But there is rewards in heaven for those who overcome. Now, the last crown, the crown of life, you'll actually find also in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says... Blessed is the man who endures or perseveres. It goes on to say you have the crown of life. In the Greek word, it means under trial. Perseveres or endures, it's under trial. It's like a proving experience. Generally speaking, it's this crown is referred to as the martyr's crown. Reserved for those who have suffered for his sake. And that would have been of comfort for the Smyrna believers. And it should be of comfort for us today. God knows our trials. He knows our oppressors as well. He knows where we are. He sees what is happening to us. Remain faithful, brothers and sisters, and we will be rewarded. I'd like you to turn one more time to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, the last little bit of encouragement this morning for us as we head out into this world that hates us and persecutes us. John chapter 16, verse 33. Christ is talking to his disciples here and he's just mentioned a whole lot of things and he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. We may have peace in Christ. Hear this. In the world you will have tribulation. In the world you will have trouble. In the world you will have suffering. But be of good cheer, or some version might say, but take heart, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. For the believer, this world is as bad as it gets. For the unbeliever, this world is as good as it gets. It doesn't mean it won't get a bit warm and uncomfortable. But remember, 1 Peter 5 verse 7, we can cast all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Something I heard recently was that mountaintop experiences are great. Climbing any mountain, getting out there and looking at it is a great experience. But when you think about it, when I thought about it, on top of any mountain, there's very little fruit ever grown on the mountaintops but rather fruit is grown in the valleys. The same can be said for our life. 
Our times of great growth and fruitfulness is in the valleys of life. Don't let me take away from the fun of mountaintops, and that should and it is meant to be enjoyed, but fruit grows in the valleys. So as the wind blows and buffets against us, let us take hold of the promises of his word that he will not give us more than we can handle. His grace is sufficient, even unto death. He will be with you, as Psalm 23 said, he will be with us through it all. And so as hard as it can be to say, do not fear the coming persecution, but look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Press on toward the goal for which we have been called heavenward in Christ Jesus, Paul says that. So from the church of Smyrna this morning, we can take three three points that I thought would be very applicable is take heart, be of good cheer as you see this world falling away. Christ says, be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. Take heart. Be faithful, not fearful. Be faithful, not fearful. Take heart. Be faithful, not fearful. Place your hope and trust in the first and the last. Trust in the first and the last. The God who knows the beginning from the end. Let us remember, take heart. Be faithful, not fearful. Trust in the first and the last. Let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, that your word just speaks to us. Thank you for the comfort that we can find in your word, that although your word says that things get hard for Christians, that the world hates us because of you, Father, we can take comfort that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that as Psalm 23 says, that you are our shepherd, that you will guide us, that our citizenship is in heaven, Father. We just thank you so much for that. And that we, we can only thank you for that because of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Lord, as we look to replace that fear in our lives with just the faith that we so desire to serve you and honour you with, Father, we just pray that we would look to the cross afresh each and every morning and just realise the cost it was to you to send your Son to die for us. Thank you, Lord. Father, we look forward to an eternity spent with your Son, an eternity where the things of this world will just pass away and be a mere distant memory, as we'll be in his presence, worshipping and, and praising him for all that he's done, for who he is. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that we can so freely have. It. And Lord, as we go out this week, may you strengthen us, May you give us the courage to stand up and speak up for Christ, no matter what the cost. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to take heart. Help us to trust in the first and last. Help us to trust in you, from the begin who was there from the beginning and who will be there at the end, the everlasting God. Father, we thank you so much this morning. We thank you in the name of our Lord and Saviour, the precious name, the name above all names our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.